Well, my name is now Anne Sever. When I was at King's, I was Anne Rubinstein. I read history from 1969 to 72. And I always wanted to be a journalist, but it's entirely thanks to King's and the history department that I am. What happened was, during my second year, my, the professor, the head of department, was J.H. Eliot, a great scholar of the Mediterranean. And his secretary said to me, well, Anne, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a journalist. How on earth was I going to be a journalist? I just had these grand ideas. So this lovely lady said she'd write me a wonderful reference, which she did. And I bravely walked across the road and they gave me a job in the Arabic service. Now, everyone always says, did you speak any Arabic? Of course I didn't. And it was just a temporary job. But it was the most wonderful introduction. And I met wonderful people. And once you can put on your CV that you've worked at the BBC, it really helps. So when I left um, King's, um, I got a job at Reuters on their graduate trainee scheme. And I was the first woman that Reuters took as a graduate trainee. So it was enormously exciting. And I felt just so privileged to be working somewhere where it was so exciting. I couldn't believe they actually paid me to do something that was so much fun. And they sent me to Rome. And I had a wonderful five, six years there. And then I went to live in America. And that's where I started writing books. But I always say it's always thanks to J.H. Eliot, Secretary at King's, for giving me that first push. So this was all very exciting, but I have to say that Reuters did not make me cover flower competitions and women's stories. I mean, they, I was plunged in at the deep end, and whatever stories the men did, I did. So that was absolutely great. On the other hand, I was terribly aware of how male and macho the newsroom was. All of that was quite difficult for a woman. They commented on my clothes and my makeup and my hair. And when I went to Rome, I was used for some of the stories that they thought the men wouldn't get. For example, when Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were having one of their great rows and arguments on off, were they married, were they getting divorced? And nobody could get to the truth of the story. And Elizabeth Taylor was in Rome. And my bureau chief sent me to the restaurant where she was. And there were queues of paparazzi outside. And again, I just smiled at the maitre d' and said, any chance I could come and interview Elizabeth Taylor? Um, and he said, OK, you go in. Now, I know that was only because I was a woman. So I wasn't seen as threatening. And I think I began to understand during that phase of my active career that actually, in some ways, it was difficult to be a woman. But actually, there were a lot of advantages. And when I was commissioned to write my book on women reporters, that was very definitely at the back of my mind. I started it with that very mixed view of the difficulties that women had faced historically. So when I was at King's, I had no idea that there was this illustrious journalism course that King's had pioneered. But when I started writing my book, I discovered it was absolutely key to the whole story of women reporters. It started in 1919, because there were a lot of men coming back from the war who needed jobs. And that was actually one of the initial, the, the impetus behind starting it up was, was to help returning soldiers. But of course, it attracted a lot of women, because women had often wanted to be reporters, but they hadn't been able, they, they hadn't been, there was no formal training for them. So some of the women that I wrote about in, in my book on women reporters, women like Florence Dixie, for example, Lady Florence Dixie, who went to Africa in the 1880s, were only trained because they'd had the good fortune to have a brother, so they were properly educated. And I think it's those sort of difficulties that women faced that were really extraordinary stories. And so bringing it up to 1919, Often women could not go to university in those days. They might not have matriculated. They might not have studied Latin. So this two-year diploma course that King's pioneered was really invaluable for women. And not surprisingly, it attracted a lot of really clever, really intelligent women who would otherwise have got 
an MA in English or, or an English degree and then gone on to further studying, but they couldn't because perhaps they didn't have Latin or perhaps their families didn't think that women should go to university. You know, there were all sorts of social difficulties that these women faced. So I'm talking about women like Elizabeth Bowen, who came to King's, um, Stella Gibbons, who wrote Cold Comfort Farm, and Molly Lefebure, who died only recently. And I thought her obituary was so interesting because you can see that she was terribly well educated. She went to North London Collegiate. She then um, studied French in Paris, so she spoke French well. She then did the traditional route that so many women had to follow, myself included, a shorthand and typing course. So terribly well qualified. And then she came to King's. And uh, th there were many women like that who really benefited and were then able, once war was declared, to cover stories and to get jobs. Molly, Molly herself wrote a lot of stories about the Blitz. So I think it, it, this course at King's closed in 1939 because then not only was the war, but the situation for women changed out of all recognition after the war. And then women went to university and got a degree. But this vocational training was terribly important. The book that I wrote about women reporters, I found such extraordinary stories of women who'd really had to battle against the odds. I, I could pick any number, but for example, Martha Gellhorn is one of the most famous. And she wrote some extraordinary stories about various stages of the war. But when it came to the D-Day landings, Colliers, the magazine for whom she wrote, only had one pass, and they decided to give it to her ex-husband, or her estranged husband then, Ernest Hemingway. So Martha Gellhorn was absolutely furious. She decided she would dress up as a nurse as an orderly, as a stretcher bearer, and somehow got onto one of the hospital ships and wrote her story and then got into terrible trouble and was even briefly arrested um, once, it, once it was discovered. But nonetheless, she got her story. So moving forward, I finished my book 20 years ago. And I suppose I finished it on a really upbeat note. I thought, you know, all the barriers were down. It was just at the time of the war in former Yugoslavia, and a lot of women were writing about that, and I just felt that there was no story that women couldn't cover, from politics and finance to sport. However, in the intervening 20 years, from 1993 to where we are now, 2013, as I talked to women reporters and as I looked at the figures and the statistics of journalists killed, I realised that journalists were targets themselves. Journalists were being killed and that actually women were in great danger, not only of being killed, but women were targets for rape. And as I started to talk to some of the really big names in the field, Janine Di Giovanni, Maggie O'Kane, I realised that actually a lot of women had suffered post-traumatic stress. A lot of women had had breakdowns. Women who'd become mothers, and this is where it's really controversial, but women who'd become mothers were starting to find that actually being a war reporter was not compatible with real care and concern for children. I focused in my new chapter on a number of women, but in particular, I looked at Anna Politskovaya, the Russian woman who was murdered. Now, she was certainly not murdered because she was a woman, but I think what you can take away from her story is her extraordinary tenacity. She was not going to give up. She was an arch critic of Putin. She was really focused on finding out the truth in Chechnya and eventually she was killed. She'd had many death threats before. I was privileged to meet her after one death threat when they tried to poison her on a plane. And she just said, you know, they'll, they'll carry on trying. But she was not going to let anything get in her way. And Laura Logan, who was attacked in Tarrier Square, she was raped. 
Now, I think that story focuses one on why an attractive Western woman in a Middle Eastern country, Muslim country, but not always, is perhaps a target. Because Western women, they're doing a job that traditionally women in those countries have not done. So they're obviously easily identifiable. They are a focus. And they are, arguably, provocative. Laura Logan was extremely experienced, but somehow she became detached from her television crew. And her horrific attack was unquestionably because she was a woman. Advice for students who want to go into a career for journalism, there's absolutely nothing better. I mean, it's absolutely great. Do it. Get as much experience, travel as much as you can. It's a cliche to say it's exciting, but it is because you have to be an expert in so many things in such a short space of time. And it's that sort of every day is something really different on the cutting edge. You could be um, covering a film one minute and meeting Peter Ustinov and on a film set all day. And the next day you'd be covering a crime. The, the big crime when I was in Rome was the kidnap of John Paul Getty. So it, it's that enormous variety and suddenly having to be an expert in stories that five minutes ago you knew nothing about and the next day there'd be another story. And in, in some ways you can't learn that. I think what journalism can teach you is how to get to the essence of a story. It's just terribly exciting to communicate what it's like to have, as more famous people than I have said, a ringside seat in history.